A woman should be able to control her fertility. And unless you can do that, you can't control your life. Without family planning as an organisation, we girls wouldn't have had anywhere to go when we were young university students needing contraceptive advice. It's so important that every child is wanted. And that's why family planning has existed and will continue to exist in the future. We are Family Planning New South Wales, the first organisation dedicated to providing sexual and reproductive health services in Australia. And we first opened our doors in 1926. Our early driving forces were Lily Goodison, whose life and work for the cause were inseparable. A colleague once remarked, she is the society and without her there would be no society. She worked alongside Ruby Rich, an important figure in the women's rights movement and noted pacifist. We began as the Race Improvement Society, then the Racial Hygiene Society and the Racial Hygiene Association of New South Wales. I think the women were very clever, the pioneers of family planning. They thought that if we're saying it's for eugenic reasons, these, we're offering contraception to people who were unfit for parenthood, that they could uh, come around the back way and uh, be offering contraception under this, what they call the umbrella of eugenics. So it was, I think, a good, savvy political move. I don't think they believed in eugenics very much at all. Even in the early days, we were working hard to improve access to services for all Australians, applying in 1935 for a patent for a diaphragm in an effort to make them more readily available. And as pioneers, we introduced sex education courses to New South Wales in 1942. Embodying our pioneering spirit, Sister Muriel Dean worked long hours in isolation to provide services to the people of Newcastle as a nurse and midwife in the 1950s. Adapting to the times, by the 1960s we were known as the Family Planning Association of Australia and with some encouragement from Ruby Rich, Vimy Wimhelm stepped into the role of President and CEO, bringing a new level of professionalism to the organisation which raised its profile and garnered respect from the medical community and the public at large. The woman was pregnant for the second time and still really didn't know how it occurred. This era also saw a shift from dedicated but sometimes uninformed volunteers to paid, medically trained staff. Moving into a new age of great social change in the 1970s, we found ourselves at the centre of the women's rights movement. Abortion. Desirable. Lesbianism. Desirable. Rebels. Wonderful. In fact, as a young doctor, I often felt a bit discriminated against by some of these lovely but fairly paternalistic older doctors. And I think that the women that I saw also had a similar feeling that that was happening to them. And great change without was matched with great change within, as an internal struggle emerged between the conservative medical staff and a new generation of left-wing feminists. A tug of war for control of the board ensued, with both sides experiencing wins and losses, ultimately strengthening the organisation. We were fighting for the right of women to design the services that they wanted to use and to have access to those services when they needed them. There was this whole wave of women's movement stuff at the beginning of the 70s, late 60s, early 70s that everyone thought, we can do more, we can do better. And so we uh, began to take it over. And to my great surprise, I was elected to the board because we basically did a clean sweep of the board. The staff had become very twitchy about it all and so, and several of the doctors thought that we were bad news. They stacked the membership on both sides and there was a, a meeting of something like 800 people at the showground. That was when I first started at family planning. I didn't know what hit me. In the period from 1974 to 1978, an increase in government funding saw demand for services double. We would provide, as pharmaceutical benefits, free contraceptives which were prescribed by uh, doctors. I certainly don't think that uh, a woman should have to continue to bear children if she didn't want to, but just because she couldn't afford, as she many can't at the moment, to uh, avail themselves of the methods which are available. As demand for services increased in the late 70s, our focus expanded from service delivery to include research, education and training. A key initiative at the time, 
being the introduction of training courses, empowering nurses delivering important sexual health services, including pregnancy testing, breast examinations, and pap smears with more extensive clinical skills. Informing our decision-making was our comprehensive research program. The research program has been going since 1990, so and it's just continued to develop over the years. It was, you know, set up initially by Dr. Edith Weisberg. It's expanded enormously in this time. Uh, we're lucky to be able to incorporate research into our daily work, whether that's health promotion or clinical services, and it means that we can actually create the evidence. So we're actually delivering really best practice services, where often we've actually helped create that evidence around what is best practice. So it's a privilege to be involved in the research centre. The 80s saw us facing a decrease in funding and tough decisions had to be made, pitting clinical services against education and training. We had to borrow 1.9 million in, the in my first year to actually stay afloat and to pay wages. Despite these challenges, our resilience carried us through and we continued to support the community, reaching out with our innovative design and promotion, with our campaigns appearing everywhere from the sides of buses to the pages of glossy magazines and the new frontier of social media. A great example of our groundbreaking campaign work was the Feeling Sexy, Feeling Safe Disability Project, empowering people with a disability to make independent decisions around their sexuality. My private place is my bedroom at home. Yes. You want to come to my house tonight? After work, okay. We can only go into my bedroom and kiss there. There's also a series of films that um, the organisation produced and one of those was directed towards people with a disability and um, again very direct uh, um, but nobody else was doing it. Not all of our campaigns have been well received by the media. In response to the death of a man in a horrific homophobic attack, we commissioned a group of young people to create a diary promoting tolerance and a more contemporary view of sexuality. The editor of the, uh, the Sunday Telegraph took great exception to this and he featured the diary in double page spreads for five weekends in a row and we ended up having the, uh, the, the project defunded by um, Mr Keating who was the Prime Minister at the time. We felt that it was going to get through to young people more than the sterile um, leaflets that, that we'd been producing in the past. The support and need of the community has carried us through some of our darkest hours, including when we were forced to close the doors briefly while we desperately tried to secure professional indemnity insurance to continue our work leaving the future of the organisation in doubt. And that was a scary time, thinking that the clinics may not be able to continue. Um, but it was also, I think, a great time for the organisation because there was just a huge outpouring of support for family planning. And I think the organisation um, recognised how many women, how many people it had touched over the years to get that kind of support. By the start of 2006, it could have been back to the 1970s, with access to medical abortion being at the forefront of women's health issues. Opposing access was the right to life and pro-choice organisations determined to deny women the right to choose. It was always a source of great distress to me that the right to life picketed us and also that they wouldn't join us because we were trying to prevent abortions. Political support has also been very important to the survival of our organisation and the work that we do. Thanks to a successful cross-party campaign, the decision to change the legislation to remove access to RU486 from the hands of the medical board and place it with the anti-abortion health minister was overturned and RU486 became available to the women of Australia. Why we were able to um, pursue that campaign quite effectively was because we were quite moderate in what we came out and said. There was a lot of hysteria actually from both sides of the political spectrum and we very effectively steered a more middle course. The noughties saw us expand internationally training Pacific health workers to administer services in the context of their existing health service delivery models. In 2012, we reinvigorated our branding to reflect the evolution and modernisation of the organisation. Throughout our history, 
The needs of the community have always been at the forefront of what we do at Family Planning New South Wales. We've adapted and grown to meet the needs of the community and the times. Our programs are designed to address contemporary issues working within shifting political climates. Our extensive population health research has allowed us to collect volumes of information and data, enabling us to lead the discussion around reproductive and sexual health in Australia. At the heart of this work are our passionate and committed staff who are dedicated to ensuring that the people of New South Wales have access to quality reproductive and sexual health services. The staff are really committed and passionate. The people who have taken an interest in this organisation uh, or who've worked for this organisation uh, are really very impressive. Everyone here is so committed to our values as an organisation but also their own commitment about contributing to the wellness of the community. The clinical staff are wonderful. <laughs> I think one of the key, key strengths is that it's real teamwork. So we've got doctors and nurses and social workers and uh, now what we call assistants in nursing and reception staff all working together incredibly collegiately to, to do the best by our clients. I think the staff here are just um, wonderful.